I will go on hunger strike if Monsieur Severino and the ministers who have been contacting at DFID don't reply to our creative ideas for the sector in agriculture, <coughs> particularly in cocoa, where we affect 20 million people in developing countries with 3 million farmers. And the difficulty is that have been tried for a number of years, particularly in the last few months, to put over some very important views and actually systems to resolve some of the mainstream issues on infrastructure and in fragile states, Liberia, free time, ideas for all of these things. Not one person from DFID will pick up the phone. I had one letter back from a minister declining to uh, have a meeting. Could I send more comments for a white paper? And I do feel very, very strongly, and the reason I'm here is you know, I'm a little bit disappointed with the way it's gone from, from Simon's inspirational open, opening comments and the brief. I feel as though we're going to be shuffling the cards. Yet again, I understand the strategy and the structure, and I do really see how this can work and how maybe syndication of development uh, agendas in developing countries would work between a number of donors. But I really would like the gentleman from AFD and from DFID to carefully look at those things they've had for months and just give me a call, have a meeting or something, I'll be very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're now going to be available after the meeting, but just before you sit down, um, paint a picture without going into huge detail about the cocoa thing, because I know you have a lot of, a lot of quite complicated... Um, what um, the, what the, well, let me ask the question clearly. What does strong European-level support for the private sector in developing countries look like? Okay, I think going forward, the real vision for the future is how you, the failure of budgetary assistance to trickle down to those cocoa communities. Now, if we take Ghana, um, there's say 180 district assemblies, and those district assemblies will typically uh, have 180,000 people and a number of quite a big, say 900 square kilometers, something like that, but there are different shapes and sizes. Now, at the, what's happening with donor policy, I, I suspect in many developing countries, the, the recipient country is more or less saying what the donors want to hear. And therefore, you find the urban drift, you'll find industrialization on the agenda, but not actually working. And all the, the rural people, the rural sector, tend to get left behind. Now you go to, say, a district assembly, and you'll find all the monitor. you'll see the hand of DFID, or the hand of the EU, in the monitoring and evaluation policies, but there isn't actually a great deal to monitor and evaluate, because you can see the gaps. Uh, one I went to, uh, just to give one example, it said schools available, school blocks available, I think it was 20. Number needed, 500. Uh, one of the areas, 87% clean water not provided. Now, we, we get challenged on this from a media point of view on all sorts of things so that we, we're expected people will think bad of us, and it's not the, that case at all. It actually, cocoa is a force for good. So if I give you another example on taxation, if you think that 240,000 people in Europe work on confectionery, and say 180,000 <coughs> of those will be in, say, chocolate only, so that's the cocoa link, we're paying VAT at 15%, say 12%, average across Europe. There are corporate taxes, employment taxes. Now, where do we see this money going back into the district assemblies? Not as a competitive issue, but this is where we manage diversification, because to paint the picture that I think that I need to paint is three million farmers, cocoa farmers, to produce 3.6 million tons is fantastically poorly productive. Now, if we start to tinker with that in an artificial way, which, of course, the European uh, Union and DFID and others and do you know, promote niche markets. Now, you have to really think about niche markets, and there'll be some comments that will be posted up next week on Trading Vision's website, which is uh, divine, so that's there. But they ask for the comments because they know that we have the big picture in mind. Now, if you start to tinker with that and increase productivity, which, which farmers become the most marginalized if you haven't tackled the infrastructure in their communities? Now, we really understand that these sort of things. We can come up with systems where public-private partnerships, effective public-private partnerships, with your creativity, would work. Okay, that's very good. And I, I have the conversation privately, but the bigger issue is 
whether we are engaging sufficiently with the real productive <coughs> sectors, providing the infrastructure and the support services for cocoa and, and other sectors in many other places. And that comes back to one of the, 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 the issues I kind of pinpointed at the beginning, which is, is budget support the right thing to do? And how do we use loans and equity stakes and so on in order to make a difference? I want to collect some conversations and then we'll see where we go from there. Who else would like to contribute? Uh, Shreya, come, come forward and we'll take these two here. Thank you, Alistair Ray. Um, I work for DFID, but I'm on secondment to the European Investment Bank. And I think my vision for a, um, an EU is actually uh, all the uh, European uh, funding that is destined for developing countries is used in a more coherent and more optimal way. Now, what do I mean by that? There's a multiplicity of different mechanisms out there. You mentioned just a moment ago budget support. There's trust funds, there's grant money, there's uh, concessional loans, there's, there's private sector and commercial loans, there's blending that's available. What we lack is a framework to optimize these different sources of, of funding for um, best development purposes. And I think if you start with that framework, then some of the risks that were being identified, like uh, member states going their own way, wanting to put flags on different things, that starts to fall away because if you've got a strong, coherent framework on how to optimize your funding, um, that will provide a driver within which people can then work together. Does country ownership also deliver that? So that are you also speaking in support of the ACRA agenda on harmonization definitely and alignment? Yes, definitely, yes. So okay. that's a major player. Very good. In front of you, two in front. <coughs> My name is Hans Ulrich, um, CVO Public Policy Consulting. Uh, I'm a German, and uh, um, as a German, you have to deal or learn about Dr. Faustus by Goethe. Dr. Faustus was a gentleman who tried to understand by all means what held life together, the core issues behind life. He tried it for all his life. He uh, uh, went into black magic. Uh, he even made the pact with the devil, as we know. I suggest that um, in order to understand how to improve all of this, we have to understand what drives EU policy, development policy, everything. We don't, it's not as complicated as the uh, issue that Faust was looking into. We don't have to do, do a pact with the devil to find out what the, uh, uh, what the approach could be. Uh, ODI once had a talk by Jack Chapman, I think, right? Jake, on, Jake Chapman. Jake Chapman on um, systems thinking. I personally think that systems thinking is an approach that we should take. One key issue which was mentioned here is that the um, commissioner would play a very big role in making EU policy effective. Now, the Commissioner is also, in terms of systems thinking, a system. And I think one of the keys to making um, the system effective is also to define exactly what kind of qualities this Commissioner needs to make the system effective. Okay, very good. Uh, I'd like to hear some people of the opposite gender before we move back to the panel. Are there any women in the room who'd like to speak? Right at the back there, please. Hello, I'm afraid I don't have a hunger strike point, but I hope I, people don't mind me answering my, asking my question anyway. I've been to several events over the last uh, year to 18 months um, where issues that Can came up... you say up, who you are? Sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm Kirsten Johnson from Voluntary Service Overseas, um, where issues about the Accra Agenda for Action have come up. Um, and also, that although this debate here is on a much higher level than some of the others I've been to, those issues are still coming up. Um, we have a lot of country offices with VSO, um, so we have a sense at country level what might be happening at country level in terms of progress towards donor alignment and harmonization. But I have yet to be able to find any kind of, kind of overview or general sense of what progress is actually being made on the ground. Um, and it would be very interesting from VSO's point of view, and I'm sure the point of view of other INGOs, to 
to have a sense of what, what overall um, progress is being made on the ground. Um, so if the panel has any uh, ideas about where I can get that or if there is any um, views, general views on that, that would be very useful for us. Thank you. I can tell you that there is a monitoring report agenda that was published in time for the ACRA meeting yes and if you can't find it drop me an email and I will send it to you but it should be on the ACRA uh, website but I think the point that you're you're actually putting your finger on is whether or not we are sufficiently harmonized and the implication of your question is that we're not and the April package issued by the Commission estimates the cost of all this duplication that uh, Paul particularly was talking about at between five and seven billion dollars a year and I was working out uh, earlier on today that that's about $20 for every man, woman, and child in Europe is wasted just because we are insufficiently well working together, if that number's right. Uh, your, your, what? Can I just add? Five to seven billion a year is what the Commission is saying. And just also as a, an add-on to that, I think listening to the debate here has made me realise that um, some, of the some of the progress that might be made, being made at country level is perhaps being hampered by some of the larger policy issues and cooperation here in Europe and whether or not any analysis of that has been made which would be useful to know how okay. to go forward. Very good. We'll come to the panel shortly. Anybody else want to speak? Not necessarily only... Oh, there, is, there are some more. I don't <coughs> mind being so, so uh, discriminatory, but anyway, please. Thank you. I'm Janice Giffin from INTRAC, which is the International NGO Training and Research Centre based in Oxford. Um, I just wanted to, to sort of expand on the idea of ownership um, and what we mean by ownership, because the Paris Declaration sort of assumes there is one national consensus on, at, at country level on um, development, development policy, development agenda. And I know that at the moment EuropeAid is um, uh, trying to institutionalize within delegations that there should be a role for local civil society in, in their deber deliberations, not only under Cotonou, but, but more, more broadly. And it would be a pity to lose that, because it seems to me that ownership should mean something more than, you know, that, that there is some sort of recognition that um, there, that there is plurality within countries that there would be you know, the need for discussions and debates about um, uh, development policy. And it would be a pity to lose that. Um, if EuropeAid is currently trying to institutionalize that, what will happen in the immediate future when things are reorganized? Will we lose that? I would hope we wouldn't. Mm, very good. OK, just before we come back to the point, I want to test your degree of Europeanness. Um, this is from the presentation that Michaela made yesterday. We will put it on the website, I think, if, if we will just vet it to make sure there are no things we shouldn't. Um, where are we? This is, is our projection of what's going to happen to the European Commission share of European Union development cooperation. I think Jean-Michel said it was about 80% is currently bilateral, so to speak, and 20% goes through the Commission. Um, and it's likely to fall because the amount of money available to the Commission is fixed by the financial perspectives on the one hand and the settlement on the European Development Fund on the other. When we showed this yesterday, Richard Manning, who was the chair of the DAC until quite recently, said, well, of course, this calculation of the share does depend on people meeting their aid pledges, which is still rather an open question. Um, nevertheless, 20 plus or, plus or minus a little bit seems to be about the figure. I'd like you to indicate for me whether you think that is A, about right, B, too much, or C, too little as a share, just so I get a sense of whether you think 20% of our aid going through Brussels is in the ballpark or not. So if you think it's about right, put your hand up. If you think it's one, two, uh, if you think it's too much, put your hand up. If you think it's too little, put your hand up. Uh, so quite a lot of people would like to see a larger share, and there are quite a lot of don't knows. Uh, let's take another number and just test you on that. Say it was 40% of all our aid going through Europe. Put your hand up if you think that would be about right. Uh, put your hand up if you think that would be too much and too little. So I think the, the sense is somewhere between 20 and 40% would be the majority view, which implies 
trying slowly, step by step, to increase the share of European aid in the total. Uh, uh, that was an entirely scientific sample, Martin, but um, uh, you may want to think about it. Uh, let's come back to the panel quickly. Two or three issues that have been raised here. The issue about uh, uh, delivering aid to sectors, I think, is a really important one. And maybe, Richard, we should start with you on that because the African Development Bank is so strong in that area. Let's talk a little bit also when we come along the panel about budget support and, and whether that is a modality that has any value, how we combine private public um, um, funding. And then uh, this question of uh, ownership is also, I think, worth a bit of a discussion. Richard, I'll start with you. Okay, thank you very much. You know, you first said that I had a Japanese wife and, and uh, I wanted to go back to the private sector and I, you know, I think people do things differently. And, and if you look at the Chinese or the Japanese, uh, they focus more on private sector development. Uh, and uh, if you look at the TICA, they don't only focus on agriculture, they focus on tourism, they also create African-Asian trade forums. So I mean, I think I, I think different different groups of countries do things differently, have different traditions. Uh, uh, so I mean, I, I, w I would tend to believe that that uh, Europe has its own traditions, focuses more on social and education, health, and that can be complemented by others. So I just wanted to say that that there are actually a lot of donors, not maybe from Europe. Uh, that are active in, in the private sector and, and less in the social sectors. So that, that's uh, my first comment which I wanted to make. The second comment was uh, on, on budget support. First of all, I have to say you know, about this aid, I'm actually very happy that the participants talked a lot about aid effectiveness and aid efficiency. And I think that for the African development point of view is, is, is very important and the issues of the AAA and, and the Paris Declaration was mentioned. On um, budget support, I am, I think the African Development Bank and I personally am too very much in favor of budget support. Uh, not only that, but I also, I actually did before my current job, I actually undertook several budget support operations in Africa. So I know it's, it's you know, people think it's always a free check, but it's not. You know, there are deliverables the idea is basically that if you if you're if you're a government that that can deliver uh, then you should give in a priori or you should in first hand give them the confidence to be able to implement it and i think that's that's the the idea of budget support and 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 you know i think it would be a backtracking if we if we start going back from that kind of kind of approach um and I think I'll leave it at that. Yeah, Thank that's you. good. Martin, how much have we just raised? How much have you just raised for infrastructure in Southern Africa? Was it a billion? Uh, um, uh, yeah, thing? just just over a billion for the um, north-south corridor. Not it was not just DFID. Uh, we were heavily <laughs> heavily involved with the um, with the Commission and a range of other donors, including African um, uh, Development it, Bank. It doesn't include Ghana, of course, does it? But uh, no. Uh, um, I just think on. Um, I, mean, I, I can't comment on, on Ghana or, or Sierra in terms of the, um, what the right kind of balance of our own effort should be there. And I, I mean, I think just on a general point, the way we approach our involvement in, in any country is, is starting off with country ownership, the country plan, um, whatever it happens to be, poverty reduction strategy or, or, or whatever, and work out from that and try and have as much kind of country lead on these issues as possible. Um, and that's how we try and construct our, the most effective part of our program. As it happens, I'm going to be in West Africa in a late, later on in the year, and I'll be very interested to follow up with our office there and with others, what you know, the right balance might be between sector and more general uh, budget support. But I was very interested from what others were saying about this, as, as Richard said, about the, the stress on aid effectiveness and the follow-up to, to Accra. Um, Accra was a kind of, it was, was a very important posting point. It, it said what we should all do. It set the bar very high. And there's the onus is on us, really, on all, of, uh, all the people who signed up um, to, make, to deliver that. Um, and we will be, be kind of pressing that through Europe. And I think the next, kind of next, in next year, there will be a, a review at this time next year of our effectiveness as Europe on following Accra, and we are being very kind of strict on um, following up within DFID that we, where we've signed up to things, we are actually delivering on them. 
and we're trying to put that message right through the organization but we're not there yet and there's a lot more work to be done would you like to say something about mixed funding and uh, and how we you know budget support and project finance and loans and equity stakes and public private partnerships which has been one of douglas alexander's headline themes i think since he became secretary of state what well, we need to use all these yeah you know, that's right i mean i think we shouldn't for us budget support is is a very effective use of assistance it, it doesn't work uh, it's not appropriate everywhere particularly in kind of fragile states that's not the most appropriate it needs to be accompanied with technical assistance there's a, a big role for looking at innovative financing um, arrangements we've had the um, uh, the IFIMs for uh, we're looking at IFIM uh, arrangements in the health task force which is being kind of which has been set up looking for innovative ways of financing health systems we've had that for um, for malaria as well so there's a whole range of different um, uh, types of financing instrument and we shouldn't get just hooked on on one or two uh, Jean-Michel let me come to you uh, with a microphone Sorry. thank you yeah, thank you very much. I would be very happy, of course, to follow up on COCOA. Uh, we have been uh, over the years, uh, actually AFD is a quite, is, has been over a long period of time more growth-oriented uh, organization than a social-oriented organization, maybe an outlier within Europe in this respect. And uh, we, so, and we have been involved uh, quite heavily into uh, crop export support, export crop support, uh, cocoa, uh, cotton, and so forth. So we'd be very happy to uh, follow up on the discussion and get into more more details. We have not done that in Ghana or Sierra Leone, but for instance in Ivory Coast, etc. And there are a lot of similarities. Now, coming to the budget support issue, and I would like to make two, two comments. One is that budget support is one instrument among uh, many, and uh, its degree of use depends very much on what type of operations and what type of sector you're in. If I take, for instance, the areas in which we are more involved, uh, transportation, power, uh, water, agriculture, uh, make up to, between, depending on the years, between 65 and 75 percent of what we do. In those areas, uh, what you are first looking for is a coherent uh, sectoral policy by government with with, that deals with tariffs, that deals with institutions, that deals with uh, uh, links between the private and the public, and so forth. And within that, there are items that you can fund directly through the budget, but many others that you can fund only through project uh, specific projects. Because if you go for a very heavy infrastructure, if you go for a dam, if you go for a road, if you go for, in most cases, you will have to go through a structured project. And if you go for power plant uh, as well. So, uh, and, and, you know, let's remind, let's remember that infrastructure, uh, by the very uh, volumes uh, that, that it catches will be a major part of the uh, budgets, investment budgets of the countries in which we operate and should be also a very important part of the budgets of the uh, developing institutions. Now, on the other hand, of course, if you go, if you are in areas like health, education, uh, but there are also uh, other items, uh, budget support is, uh, if you have the right uh, governance in front of you, is of course the right way to go uh, for, for, the, for, for, the, for the funding. And you should go, every time you have an opportunity to, go, to do that, you should go, go for it. So we, we, we have to take a non-ideological view of uh, what the instrument is and just push it every time it is relevant. Uh, and it's not always the case. Now, the additional thing that I would like to say is about, and this issue is about uh, coordination. It's clear, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm cautious about the numbers that we get about the costs of non-coordination because there are also very high costs about coordination. When you look at the administrative cost of dialogue in country and outside country, you get sometimes to uh, um, unrealistic amounts of energy when considered to the nature and the volume of the things that you're dealing with. So we have, we have to, to, to balance things and also to see when it's relevant to go for shared uh, uh, actions and instruments and, and where it doesn't make sense. Uh, and if you, I have very specific visions of very specific countries in which we have gone overboard and which the International Committee spends its time meeting with the government and meetings amongst itself 
uh, while actually delivering very little in terms of factual contribution to development. So let, let's be careful of the fact that uh, talking becomes more important than uh, doing. And then let's me to my third comment, because I would like to react on uh, what is a biased question by you, uh, Simon, to the audience. When you say, what should be uh, the uh, proportion of uh, EU funding, uh, commission funding within the uh, overall EU effort? Well, it depends from, it depends on what is your vision about what the EU should do. If you think, for instance, that you should be a major funder of infrastructure, it should not be 20%, but maybe 70%. If you want EU to fund massively roads, uh, railways, uh, and so forth, then if you think that EU should deal mainly with soft issues, you may go for much slow, uh, smaller numbers. And if you think that, for instance, the role for, of EU is not to fund, but to create the conditions of convergence of the EU members, you can do that with 5% of the total of, of aid. The EU has taken a major role in shaping the investment agenda in the Mediterranean and in Eastern European countries through the vicinity uh, fund, which accounts for two or 300 million euros when, for instance, the three major players uh, that were mentioning in the meter, uh, in, in infrastructure in the Mediterranean, EIB, AFD, KFW, would disburse probably four or five billion euros a year on the Mediterranean only and for infrastructure only. But for with 100 or 150 million euros uh, of soft money for infrastructure, the EU gets the power and drives everybody into converging into the same goal. So the real issue is not the one that you put. The real issue is what the Commission is there for. And my take at that is that, of course, the Commission is not, to take the, is not there to take the place of stakeholders that have been operating quite well for decades. But it's there to make them converge within the framework of a single and coherent European vision. And in, in order to do that, you need to be smart. You, you need to be creative, and you need a little bit of money, but not that much. So does that imply, I mean, that's very interesting. Does it imply that you're an enthusiast for the code of conduct? Sure, hmm. sure. And I'm enthusiastic about the soft power of the Commission. And one of the major mistakes that we have uh, uh, allowed uh, to take place uh, over the years has been for the Commission to think itself as the N plus one spender of money. The issue is not for the Commission, in my mind, to be the 28th donor, or the 7th, then the 16th, and then the 28th, and soon, you know, the 30th or the second, 32nd donor in the, of, of the world. It's, 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 it's a useless word. We don't need that, actually. We don't need it for, for doing that. That we can achieve by ourselves. The member states can do it by, by their own. The issue is whether the Commission is able to invest in intelligence, invest in policy making, invest in, invest in convergence instruments, all things it has not been doing because it was obsessed by disbursing. And to a certain extent, uh, if I push, uh, it's provocative, okay? I agree on that, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you, you, you won't agree on, on, uh, on what I'm saying. To a certain extent, you know, pushing the agenda of disbursement, the disbursement agenda of the EF, EDF is probably a futile goal. It's, it's not the right one. It's not where we should expect the EU to be. The, uh, somebody agrees. Uh, <laughs> uh, just, just, just quickly before I bring in uh, the other two. Just, the, the Code of Conduct says, and I can't remember the precise number, is it not more than three donors in any sector, not more than three sectors per donor? Is that right? Something like that. Uh, so is, would AFD endorse that as a, as a general rule? Well, let me, so I, I, Anderson, I, I answered wrongly, uh, sorry. Uh, I'm all in favor of a code of conduct. Now, this rule is absolutely stupid because it won't ever be respected. You won't ever prevent, you know, the 27 countries uh, in Europe to be present in the field if they wish. Even more as the incentives do not work into withdrawing them. So what's the use of having a role that has no sanction in the context where incentives go against its implementation? It's just useless, it's, it won't ever be respected. The issue is if we have 10 donors or 10 European members uh, which are operating 
because they may not be donors, they may be uh, you know, of all sorts operating in, in a country, what is the rule of the game that you build in order to allow them to converge uh, on the same type of goals and deliver with rules of the games, with processes that are consistent with uh, each other. And that the EU has started doing it in a very smart way, and this is the way forward. Let me give you the example. The, uh, within the, the uh, EU infrastructure fund, uh, which is an EDF uh, uh, animal, or in the vicinity facility, which is an Eastern Europe and Mediterranean facility, investment, what does the EU say? You know, the Commission says, say, look, guys, uh, you have put, uh, I've put 100 uh, in a trust fund. You, all of you have put two, three, four, okay? So we have a big shared pot. And now, what we are going to do is each of you that comes to the shared pot with a project, an operation, a program support, etc., that uh, fits into uh, the global policy and the global rule of the game that we have all agreed uh, while building. Uh, the, the, the pot trust front. So everybody that comes will have some funding from that. So now what is very important is that you have a process that allows you the discussion, forces you to discuss the common goals. You have a financial incentive to, do, to go to the pot because it adds to what you do. You have a mechanism that allows you to put your flag in the real world, what is very important for your political masters, while at the same time being uh, convergent with what the uh, shared with the shared vision has, and you have a strong incentives to go for an alignment of your processes, because if you because one of additional constraint that those pots build is the necessity to co-finance and to share the operations with other European members. And if you, if you daily deal with, if, you, if I'm AFD and I am daily uh, have to live with EIB, KFW, and blah, 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 and blah, 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 at the end of the road, I have a strong incentive, incentive in order to cut my own costs to have to share the same delivering processes and methodologies, okay? Which is exactly what is happening. Now, if you consider the amount of the money that the EU is putting into this type of pot and the volume of investments that it triggers, the leverage is absolutely huge. The in financial leverage is huge. The actual impact is very important. And the convergence uh, is uh, also extraordinarily uh, uh, efficient and, 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 and visible. So this is a type of role that you, you should, one should think for uh, the EU. And the problem is not, the problem is that uh, the EU has been only recently concentrating its energy into thinking this type of processes into, unless uh, when compared to spending its own money on a lot of things that the member states would do. And finally, let me uh, end with that, I'm sorry. Uh, this, this also goes with the uh, geostrategic vision of what the Commission is there. Now, wh wh the reason why we are in such a mess and having all these sort of discussions is because uh, our British friends and uh, the French in the uh, 60s wanted the rest of Europe to pay for their former colonies. So we were very good at creating what became uh, the uh, EDF. Okay? and building mechanisms that were going to our own clients. Okay. But we were all very active in our former colonies. So instead of saying, which would have been a very different take, instead of saying the EU is a considerable powerhouse, let's have the EU working on Asia and Latin America where nobody is operating. And you know, we, uh, 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 former colonial masters, will go on with our business there. We have focused on sharing the bill with others. Okay, that was a real financial, practical meeting. And as a consequence, we have concentrated all the EU common tools in the areas of the world where we were massively operating. And in the rest of the world where the EU should pull all its resources because the challenges are huge, the volumes are enormous, and the bilateral presence is very small, the EU is virtually inexistent. Now, maybe this was a right calculation to make in the 60s. Is it really the right thing to do today? 
shouldn't we say, okay, the Brits, the Germans, the French, the, uh, the, the Dutch, etc., they are very good in Africa. Let them operate in Africa. Why, why, why should we add instruments there? But let's focus our shared energy in the areas of the world where we, as a, as a European entity, we want to weigh more, but we have very limited means. So let's, let's use this. Uh, that's why I wanted to underline when one speaks about vision. Let's, and globalization, we have changed world. We are not in the world of the 60s. Uh, we have gone uh, com in a completely different world, and this calls for complete revisiting of the way we, we operate and the way we use our instruments. And that, that, that's the reason why your, your, your question was biased, Simon. I feel I've been invited into Rembrandt's workshop where a masterpiece is being produced. What you're seeing here is European consensus as work in progress. I think this is a really fascinating discussion. So uh, I, I don't mind being accused of being biased. And I want to hear from Dirk and Paul. Uh, uh, Dirk, because your institute, I think, produced the background paper for the Code of Conduct on yeah. Complementarity and so on. Yeah, we prepared this paper on the division of labor during the German presidency. And I would like to pick up some of the points that you made, Jean-Michel, because this, this is a very important point, I think. Be because the question that we are discussing here, how, how are we coming from our loose patchwork, or let's say chaotic patchwork in Europe, development policy, in the area of development policy, to something more coherent and to something more towards collective, joint collective action. And I would say that I agree with you in certain points and I don't in others. The first point is that I think that money really counts because money is about political power. It's about budgets. So if we talk about Europe and then give only 5 to 15 percent to the European level, this will not work because budgets and money counts. This is about political power. Very simple. Then the second point, and, and I agree with you, this is very important. I think that if we think about how, f how to come from A to B, from the patchwork thing to something stronger, in general, we do have two options. The first option uh, would be integration, much more integration. This is the point that uh, Paul made. The second uh, option would be uh, something that I would uh, argue for, and I have the impression that you are thinking in the same direction. I would call it a strong European network, a strong European cluster. The analogy would be from the private sector that if you look to Mercedes-Benz or Volkswagen or any other important company in the world, the value added of Mercedes-Benz that they really produce, producing the car, is around 20%. It has been around 80 30 years ago. So 80% of the value added of a Mercedes-Benz is coming today from the network of Mercedes-Benz. This implies that Mercedes-Benz is not the producer of the car. Mercedes-Benz is the producer of the network. It is a network manager. So if I think about the European Union, I would have in mind a strong European network and the Commission and the Presidency interacting, of course, so the Commission and the Member States. Commission uh, should organize this kind of strong network. And this is not, uh, not only about money, because we have to, to reflect then on how to create a political framework and incentives to make that work, joint action. And this is about targets and vision, where would we like to go to. This is about policies, joint policies. This is about division of labor. What, is, what are you doing? Like, what are we doing? What, what are you doing afterwards? And how to bring that together, complementarities and, and so on. This is about uh, joint evaluation and monitoring systems afterwards. And in this framework and, and creating this kind of incentive scheme, we would create a joint policy without too much hierarchy. So this is my vision about a strong European Excuse me, cluster. There's only one Mercedes at the end of this exercise. Sorry? There's only one Mercedes-Benz vehicle at the end of this exercise. So only one what? Vehicle. One Mercedes-Benz car yeah. driving off the production line. Yeah. So how many, I mean, I'm a, sorry, I'm trying to understand what you're saying about yeah. the network. Yeah. Is there basically one delivery mechanism for European aid in the but way for, that there for is? Me, Euro, for me, the European development policy as a cluster would be the all Mercedes-Benz. I saw your paper here on, on making Europe, uh, make, making European aid a benchmark for development policy. So our, 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 our po joint policy package from the Commission and all our member states within this strong network would be all Mercedes-Benz. And, the, and the, 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 the presidency in cooperating with the Commission would organize this strong network. But all the other member states would be very important parts, of course, 
of this strong network. So it is much more a network-based okay. approach than an integration and higher coming approach. Forward. Um, do you want to defend the code of conduct while you have the floor? Yeah, for me, the code of conduct is key uh, if we talk about uh, Paris, ACRA, and aid, aid, aid effectiveness. And the, the argument behind is that I think that if we work any longer and further with the big, big number problem, too many actors and then too many donors and all the sectors and all these countries that we, are, that we are working in, we will not be able to organize aid effectiveness because the transaction costs to coordinate ourselves, that's your point, point Jean-Michel, Jean uh, sorry, uh, will be very, very high. So reduce the number of uh, actors is very important and the key there is um, division of labor. Okay, Paul. Yes, yeah, I, I think I'm going to take a little time on um, um, explaining that we are an independent institute. Uh, we are not depending on the Commission, because what I now say is going to defend the Commission a bit. Um, I think the Code of Conduct is exactly the Code of Conduct that Mercedes-Benz is applying worldwide on its suppliers. That's what is happening. You divide the labor, you are complementary, and you produce one product. That's exactly what the ID between the voluntary Code of Conduct is, and in that sense, I think, um, I think uh, Jean-Michel is very right. There's no sanction involved. So the question now is, does it work? Um, we started doing evaluation of coordination between EU member states and the Commission in the field in 2005. Um, the interesting thing about the business consultant who did these evaluations is that one of his conclusions was, you people talk a lot, it is very costly, but you don't reap the benefits of all the talking because you don't coordinate actually, you just talk. Um, that very harsh conclusion led to rethinking, it was before the whole code of conduct was, was, uh, uh, was uh, made up, and I think it's part of the input from the evaluation services of the EU, by the way, including the Commission, UK, Netherlands, Belgium, France, um, that they actually came up with these types of conclusions, we need to be serious about coordination, and coordination in, um, is impossible in the sense that you have a general European vision for the moment. So let's do it at the member state, at the partner country level, and let's go for coordinating our efforts in a country and, and uh, decreasing the transaction cost for the country. It was an important and uh, being more effective. Now, of course, there you enter in the whole terrain of country ownership, leadership, harmonization, alignment, because this was squarely uh, directed at improving EU behavior in terms of the Paris Declaration and later on the Accra uh, Agenda for Action. What are the results at the moment? The evaluation of Paris for Accra was very clear. There, are some, there is some progress, but it's too tentative. It's, too, it's not strong enough. At the same time, the, the um, uh, all the scepticism about the code of conduct uh, in our, you know, we are, we are trying to study what is actually happening. We were quite skeptical, but lately, especially the last year, we have been, uh, we have been seeing a lot of initiative by different member states to actually align co-finance, to in fact try to invest in cooperating much more on, on not only on budget support, also on, on other issues. So actually, something is happening, and it's not only the Commission, it's uh, more the Code of Conduct, it's something that the EU, not the Commission, the EU has agreed to, that means all the member states. So they are now working, and maybe you can say, okay, it's not fast enough, but um, uh, we see uh, definite signs that that's, uh, more things are happening. Um, the other thing was, and I, I think there was a very important question on, uh, on the, uh, the civil society organizations. The Commission has been uh, very uh, advanced since the Cotonou Partnership Agreement, actually, to include civil society, non-state actors into programming, etc. Now, they're not always as good as we would like them to be. Uh, we have written the manual for the civil society uh, organizations so that they would be informed at least whom to call at the, 
at, at their ministry and at their uh, at the delegation so that they could at least get some information because the the code the partnership agreement states the non-state actors have to be involved but then as a follow-up there was nobody who actually told everybody that they should now uh, uh, prepare for uh, for participation so also those things are slow but at the same time i think there's clear uh, there's clear progress i think uh, one of the things that we really have to think through is if we as member states and i'm speaking i'm i'm dutch so there are 15 different nationalities at our uh, center i happen to be dutch if we as member states tell the commission and the european parliament tells the commission that they should pay for everything everybody does then that's what's going to happen if we can, and I, I in, in, in principle and on, on theoretical grounds, it's obvious that the Commission shouldn't be doing in external affairs what it is not doing in Europe. Would be an interesting criteria. But it's not used. It's the European Parliament that insisted on the Commission spending a lot of money on education, for example. So let's not point at the commission that much let's try to find why we as member states drive the commission to do certain things and then of course if they mess up we can also uh, criticize them and we do that uh, frequently so uh, i have no problem now defending them a little um, at the same time i think it is exactly this this uh, sort of not really grasping and getting what the idea around this code of conduct is that gives us a lot of uh, trouble at the moment. And it can be improved, we can improve it, uh, it's been adopted, it, it could not be voluntary, but I can assure you if it had been non-voluntary it wouldn't have passed under the UK presidency through the council. So. I think let's look at what the member states uh, can do to actually specialize the commission. Okay. Thank you, Richard. One sentence or yeah. two. I'll just keep it, you know. I'll just keep it very short. You know, I just I'm literally going to keep it to one minute or even less. I heard a few key key keywords when it came to Europe: harmonization, division of labor, decreasing transaction cost, alignment, co-financing. These are not new things. <laughs> These are like Paris. This was already in the Paris Declaration. So uh, how do you call it? Uh, uh, we should we should avoid uh, avoid avoid uh, an issue like EU ring fencing, and then uh, you mean there are also other donors. I mean, from a developing country point of view, it's I mean the EU ring fencing is fine, but you know don't ring fence other donors out, don't ring fence the Canadians out, don't ring fence yeah. the Americans out, you know. So I think that's that's the the the, the, the small one minute comment okay. I wish I wish to highlight. But of course. Harmonization is always welcome. The code of conduct is inclusive. Eh? It doesn't yeah, ring okay. fence anyone out. Thank you. Listen, we've got about another 15, 18 minutes, and we're going to take six or seven at the end. I really want us to focus now in get a dozen contributions, one or two sentences each, no more, on this. What do you really want to see happen in 2009? Uh, and remember that we have this timetable of decisions. You know, at the end of the year, there will be a new commission. It will be organised in a certain way. There will be a decision about uh, the uh, uh, the um, the Lisbon Treaty, one way or the other. So I think you need to tell us what it is you want to see. Uh, and so please, can we do that? But quickly, so we get as many people in as possible. We'll start with you, Bahani, and then behind you, and then some others. One or two sentences each, please. Okay. Say who you are. Uh, ACP. Since I am not European, I'm not going to answer to your question, but I have two specific questions which concern uh, not only uh, the ACP but Africa. First one is to Richard. You said the Chinese are our competitors and uh, how about the other uh, stakeholders? Are they not competitors? Why do you think the Chinese are your competitors? And secondly, why on earth is the bank not doing it as, uh, its utmost? Somebody was saying, uh, having a pact with the devil to get the money you need for all the, the things uh, you have to do in Africa. So you should have, as a bank, an active policy 
and not uh, say the, the Chinese, the Japanese, and the others are our, our competitors. After all, it seems to me a, a contradiction and something I can't understand. Okay. Jean Michel, he uh. said EDF is a colonial uh, legacy. Yes. Then how about budgetizing it? What's how your position? Do do? How about budgetizing it after uh, 2013? Would from a, and not a French citizen, but a European perspective, would it have any advantage? Okay. If so, what? Thank you. Very good. Over there, and then over here, please, to, the, to your right, Bernie. Uh, well, my name is Peter Dunn, and I work for the European Commission. Um, I note the comments that have been made, some positive and some you know, could do better. Uh, I take these on board and I'm not going to respond to them, uh, but I just say that it seems to me that uh, it's uh, not for the Commission to be able to control the proportion which will come through the Commission, that's for the Member States to, to decide, uh, and it will depend on the performance of the Commission and the perception of that performance by the Member States. So it's up to the Member States to, uh, to uh, put their uh, uh, money where their mouth is, if you like. Um, but I would like to um, agree with those who've uh, uh, put emphasis on the Commission's role in, in building consensus, because I think that is uh, enormously important, uh, both in Brussels, uh, but also, of course, uh, on the ground. Um, and I think that the, uh, the role of the delegations in particular, uh, following the hopeful ratification of the Lisbon Treaty, uh, will, will be enhanced in that respect. Uh, it will be an opportunity for the EU as a whole um, but I think uh, also in my interpretation of the treaty, it will be a duty under the treaty, an enhanced duty under the treaty, uh, which it will be uh, incumbent on everybody to take up. But the other point about the Commission role, which is, I think, important, and it has been referred to tangentially by, by speakers, in particular Jean-Michel, is that uh, the, the purpose of a European, uh, or one of the purposes of a, of a, of a Commission involvement, uh, is to bring in uh, those member states who are not uh, traditional donors and to, uh, if you like, uh, instigate in them an interest in, uh, in uh, parts of the world uh, which their history has not brought them into contact with uh, for all kinds of reasons over the last 50 years. And I think that's a very important element. I note also that those people are not particularly well represented at this meeting, which I, uh, in, in a way, regret. Mm. Uh, since I've got the floor, I know that um, uh, the, the uh, uh, the, the, the rule is uh, at this point in the discussion to, to, to speak briefly, briefly, but let me just say a couple of words about the broader issue. Um, I think it's very important, and I agree with those who have said that we need to look um, more broadly at the way in which the EU's uh, significant leverage is deployed, uh, including uh, in, the, in the area of uh, development policy. Um, I think this includes not only uh, all aspects of external policy, including development policy, but also, of course, those internal policies with external implications which are now right at the top of the agenda, uh, and those are the ones that you have mentioned yourself, Simon, and others have mentioned as being the key issues that we have to deal with this year. Uh, uh, macroeconomic and financial crisis, uh, the, the question of climate, uh, the question of energy, uh, and also uh, a series of uh, justice and home affairs issues which are essentially internal but which have enormously important external implications. Uh, I've noticed people use the term on a couple of occasions, Europe in the world, uh, during this discussion. I would just draw your attention to the fact that we actually wrote in the Commission a communication to the European Council called Europe in the World just over two years ago. I recommend it to you. Uh, it still bears reading, and I had a, a, a part role in, in writing it. But I do think it's uh, I important that we should have that debate, and if that paper can still be uh, a useful com a contribution, then that's fine. But I think that we do need to look again uh, possibly at the point when we have uh, new institutions uh, coming into effect, uh, at uh, the whole question of the balance between our interests uh, and, our, uh, and our values uh, in external policy, including in the area of aid policy. And the impetus for that has got to come from the member states and from civil society. And I just mention in passing uh, that the call, which appears to be consensual from everybody in this room, for a strong development commissioner in Brussels is not de-linked uh, from that discussion. You say that in English, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> we need, we need a, a, a broader discussion uh, about our objectives in external policy and in aid policy, and I agree with those here who have called for that. I say that the call for a strong development commissioner mm -hmm. in the next commission is linked, linked uh, with that discussion. Need, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be crude, but we need to have that discussion 
and then create a framework within which a decision can be made about what kind of commissioner we want. But we don't have that much time, do we? If we, if we agree that that broader discussion about the kind of external policy and the kind of development policy we pursue is to take place, and I think it should take place, part of that issue is clearly the question of yeah. uh, what kind of development commissioner what kind of role he will play in the new commission. What happened to the Committee of Elders, is that what it was called, that was established to kind of think about the future of Europe? Uh, was, wasn't there such a thing involving some, some, some highly respected... Of the Felipe Gonzalez uh, operation I think you're talking about, which will uh, report in, um, I think, uh, 12 months' time, and we'll be looking at the horizons up to 2025. Right. What we're talking about now, of course, is a rather shorter, shorter term. term. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's very helpful. Okay. Thank you. There was a hand up over here. Two hands up over here. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Joe Dickman. I am not a European. I'm an American, so I apologize for being the interloper here. Um, but I found the discussion very interesting, and I work for an NGO called Mercy Corps, which implements a lot of um, European Union grants, as well as grants uh, from different member states uh, from our European headquarters in Edinburgh. And I specifically work on monitoring and evaluation. And so what I would like to see as, as uh, the European Development Cooperation Framework goes forward is a greater emphasis on monitoring and evaluation. And from a practical standpoint, from where I sit in an implementing agency, uh, what that means concretely is budget supports in, in individual projects for monitoring and evaluation. We have kind of a rule of thumb that we're trying to promote within our agency that 5 to 10% of each individual project budget should be spent on monitoring and evaluating that effort, whether that's for in external impact evaluations, uh, robust monitoring systems as the project goes along. But in practice, we find that getting that written into budgets is, is difficult. In the, and as it makes the rounds and budgets start to get cut, the monitoring and evaluation line is often something that gets reduced. And so, um, I don't know if I'd go on hunger, hunger strike, um, to, to, to emphasize this point, but I would like to see, as it goes forward and becomes more cohesive, um, a, a greater emphasis on monitoring and evaluation and, and how those budget lines could be greater, uh, more supported, um, both within the EU and within the member states' individual uh, donor policies. And would like to hear from the panel um, what they feel going forward in this integration process and, and as cooperation increases, um, how they see evaluation fitting into that framework. Good. I think we're going to take, though, your pro as a contribution and a point rather than a question because of the time constraint, but thank you. Uh, I, want to, I won't say what I was going to do about evaluation. We'll go to the back. Thanks. Uh, my name is Martin Barber, I'm formerly with the UN, and I'm now associated with a project being run by Edinburgh University on the EU and multilateralism. Uh, so I'm particularly interested in the issues of coordination that were just raised. And I wonder if you feel, uh, and to uh, rephrase it as a statement, I certainly feel that in the field of development cooperation, something could be learned from what's happened in the last 10 years in the field of humanitarian coordination, um, where the echo from being a competitor with the UN has recognized the role of the emergency relief coordinator as the global leader on humani international humanitarian action and plays an extremely positive uh, and helpful subordinate uh, role both at the international level and at the level of uh, country, uh, country situations. Thank you. Supported by the SURF, the, is that the Common exactly. Emergency yeah. uh, the Response Fund? Central Emergency, Central Emergency Response, Response Fund. Fund. Which, which pools the money. Right, uh, and the SURF, it. to everybody's surprise, has gained uh, an awful lot of support and money uh, from member states. And it, it meets one of the points which I think uh, one of the speakers was making, that it allows every participating government, and there are something like 90 donors to the SURF, to say, we have supported the international community's efforts in all major crises this year, because our money is part of every contribution that the emergency relief coordinator makes to 
meeting a crisis uh, response in a particular country. Okay, very good. Uh, just anybody who hasn't spoken, uh, last minute hunger strike points down at the front here, please. And at the back as well. We're really down to 25 words or less. If okay. you can do it. <laughs> it's uh, Elizabeth McVeigh from NR International. Um, you want to know what I wanted to see happen in 2009, and this is from a very much practical project implementation standpoint. I like the idea that the European Commission would be the coordinator of development in each country, and that when you go for a briefing, you're told about all the all the donor projects in your sector, not just the ones they choose to talk to you about. For example, a delegation will often only know about the ones where they're the NAO or they work with the local NAO. They aren't interested in the global ACP projects so much. They tend to not have ownership of it. They're not interested. And that to me is quite an issue that if you could bring about that coordination and get get the delegation to actually understand all the different initiatives and be able to explain them properly to people okay. as they arrive on the ground, I think it'd make a huge impact. Thank you very much. Uh, one here quickly, and the lady at the back will have the last word, and you really do have 25 words. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Alistair Baliati. I work for the Commonwealth Secretariat, but I used to work for the EC delegations in Eastern Europe, and uh, picking up on a couple of points about monitoring and evaluation, why doesn't the European Commission coordinate all the monitoring and evaluation for all the EU member states, and that they were, you could easily see, A, who's performing well, yeah. and B, you'd have that information that you requested, because they would all be in one place. What I wanted to say about evaluation earlier, and I, I will say now, is that actually all the interesting questions about evaluation are comparative questions. Uh, it's like, you know, how is the Commission compared to Germany, or how is, because otherwise you have no basis. You also have 25 words, please. What will you do? Please base it on systems thinking. Thank you. Oh, very good. That was very good. Uh, now, we're not going to go around the panel, but I'm going to ask Jean-Michel first, and then Martin to give a couple of closing remarks, and I will say something at the end, and then it will be lunchtime. Uh, Jean-Michel, just a couple of comments. Thank you very much. Uh, no, no, actually, I, I don't think that uh, we need to go for a, a long uh, statement at this stage because I think what, what the discussion shows is that there are a lot of hot issues on uh, and, and fascinating ones. Uh, we, we have a, a wide range of uh, thinking options on, on the table that, that we should uh, just uh, pursue and our challenge is going to uh, maintain uh, the, uh, the, the this discussion uh, on the burner and allow it to go for concrete uh, moves at some stage because we, we, we don't want we just not we are not there just to uh, nicely chat but we, we want to get something do, done uh, down, down the road. The the only um, substantive point that I would like to add is that we have to uh, be careful when not only speaking about Europe but also about the world when we think that we are going to solve the problems of the coordination by diminishing the number of players. I don't think this is realistic because we have by the year new countries stepping, it, stepping in into this development agenda. And by the way, within Europe, we encourage that, as a gentleman from the Commission stated it uh, correctly, we encourage new member states to develop their own programs. Uh, and the Koreans and the Chinese and etc. Add uh, the Asians in general add to, to it. Second, by the day new NGOs uh, come into life and start operating and new foundations, and the level of commitment and desire of the civil society throughout the world to contribute is going to make it uh, more and more difficult. Uh, to have any kind of, um, I mean, a gathering of social society stakeholders. There has been a fascinating piece of paper uh, that has been drafted by Homi Karas at the Carnegie Foundation, uh, the Wolfenstein Center, that, has, uh, that is showing uh, the increasing contribution of the civil society to the ODA, and as a consequence, the incredible uh, uh, diminution of the average size of project through the world. The more we spend on ODA, not on, I mean, ODA on the, the more we spend on development